All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, we have a very special guest joining us, um, uh, Martha Abshire Saylor. Um, she's an assistant professor on the research education track at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. Um, prior to joining the faculty there, she worked in a community and in an academic setting as a surgical, cardiac, and critical care nurse. Uh, her research interests include an emphasis on psychosocial sequelae of advanced heart failure management, biomarkers of stress, and patient reported outcomes. Dr. Abshire has current funding to develop and test an intervention that uses a strengths-based approach to support caregivers of advanced heart failure patients. So she uh, published a piece not too long ago talking about the importance of understanding the role of caregivers in the home environment for LVAT patients, which is something that's you know likely incredibly important, something we probably don't talk about enough. And, and uh, uh, gratefully, she accepted our invitation to join us today. So um, Martha, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Excellent, well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Are you guys seeing my presenter view or? Uh, yeah, we see the presenter view right now. Better? That's better. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I was uh, a travel nurse at Yale New Haven's MICU um, for a brief time be start, before I started my PhD at Hopkins. Um, and so I know your area just a little bit and did a little bit of cardiac critical care while I was in the MICU. Um, and, and I'm just delighted to be here. I know that New Haven um, in some ways resembles Baltimore and has some similar challenges. And so hopefully what I share will be relevant to you all. And especially as we're thinking about bad patients, but I just think broadly understanding the context of home is important. And um, I share this picture as kind of an extreme, but um, from the clinic, it's really hard to imagine that this might be the home environment of one of our bad patients but it is. <laughs> um, and so it really changes the way you start to talk about so many different things if you understand that um, the, the patient's home environment is a real challenge for them and, um, and that it affects their neighborhood and their willingness to be able to walk outside and, and so many different features. So social determinants, you know, very much at the root of what we're, we've been thinking about. Let's see. And if you're not familiar with this awesome scientific statement on family caregiving for individuals with heart failure, it's not specific to VAT and transplant, but is broadly applicable. A lot of these um, amazing researchers are people who've been really foundational to my understanding of the needs of families living with advanced heart failure. And um, I wanted to share this figure as kind of a way to, for us to think about what's been going on. I'm sure you are familiar with the heart failure trajectory, but probably haven't thought about it in um, in the way that caregivers are having to intervene. And um, Michael mentioned that I'm interested in resilience. And so uh, part of our um, approach to thinking about how we could support caregivers is an understanding that it's, it's often the family that's intervening from maybe the, not quite the lowest point, often that's you guys in the hospital setting, um, but they're, they're what helps you come back up to that, that baseline place. Um, and so we're really highly dependent on caregivers. And here we're thinking about um, the ways that they're supporting during decompensations, certainly during care transitions, and increasingly we're um, paying attention to them during end stage needs, and which is complicated when we're thinking about VAD. Um, and maybe you're also familiar with this figure, which is thinking about uh, the trajectory of quality of life um, for persons who live with a, a DT VAD. And, uh, you know, you've, you can probably name different people that you've cared for that have had these different experiences. And with A, B, C, and D, um, there are different family experiences that are gonna be really important um, and different approaches that we can have to helping strategically um, help families as they're navigating these really difficult challenges. So it's so funny to me, I, um, you know, Hopkins and Yale, we get along pretty well. We, we cross um, contaminated a little bit, but it's, it's funny that this was a really tiny grant that came from ISHLT, it was a $10,000 grant. And we, I, it was like the first grant I applied for when I joined the faculty and I've, it's really been so rich for my learning. And, um, and so just a, a nod to your junior faculty, don't, 
don't snub this the low money because sometimes you can really learn a lot from it. But we had to think strategically about what we could do with only $10,000. Um, so this was kind of the overview of what we said we'd do in the grant. Uh, we wanted to assess unmet needs of family caregivers in our ventricular assist device clinic. And we, we echoed this work in our advanced heart failure. Um, we have, uh, we call it the heart failure bridge clinic. It's a diuresis clinic. So we were kind of doing parallel work, but here I'm just focusing on the bag clinic. We did a dyadic mixed methods pilot study. And so it was so much to explain in the grant. We did a survey of both the patients and the caregivers. They could only be enrolled if they were enrolling as a dyad. We did semi-structured interviews in the home um, and we took photos we, uh, of caregiving areas in the home. And our aims were to describe the context of caregiving. We were thinking about condition specific, environmental, individual and family factors. We wanted to hear where there was congruence between patients and caregivers, um, understanding responsibilities that were changing in the home, shifting needs, unmet needs and prioritization. And then how those things are different in um, dyads where the caregiver rated themselves having high caregiver burden versus low caregiver burden. And probably the coolest thing that we did, which was kind of a last thing that we added was, um, hey, how are we going to remember what we saw in the home? And so we asked families if we could take pictures in their home. And this, we were doing data collection in 2019 through early 2020, we ended right before COVID, not anticipating, of course, that COVID was going to happen. So we just asked if they would take us on a home tour. And we took pictures of anywhere that they said they were, you know, providing care or doing something with the VAD where they had bad equipment. And then we used observational qualitative techniques um, to analyze the pictures. And, you know, it's a small sample size. It was a pilot study. We recruited 10 dyads. Um, six male patients, four female patients, predominantly female caregivers, which is quite typical and um, pretty consistent with our population here in Baltimore. We had about 40% African Americans. Um, we had one Asian dyad. Our average age uh, for those who participated for patients was 55, almost 56 years. Caregivers were a little younger. Um, at this time, you know, thinking about when UNOS happened in, in that season. Um, more destination therapy than bridge to transplant. And we were really trying to hit the early, um, not the earliest stage of adaptation, not the first three months post implant, but once they've gotten a little bit settled in their home, trying to understand what caregivers were doing in kind of that chronic VAD management. And then if a patient had been hospitalized, then we also recruited their caregivers if there'd been some sort of event that caused them to be hospitalized. And we, we asked this question kind of to get at social determinants. We did a little work to understand, is it income or is it financial strain that's important to families? And so we asked the question, how do your finances usually work out at the end of the month? Um, and you can see that only four of the dyads had some money left over. And so we would say that this was a pretty financially strained group. Oops. And, you know, this is mostly a qualitative study, and I imagine that you guys don't do tons of qualitative work in medicine, but um, just so that you don't panic, we do have a couple of numbers in front of us. And so we rated symptom burden using the heart failure somatic perception scale. This is not one that's used um, too much clinically, but we do see it in some papers these days. And we asked patients and caregivers to both rate the patient's symptoms. And they were pretty congruent in the way that they assessed the patient's symptoms. And just a nod to the other work we did um, in non-VAD supported patients, their symptoms were much higher. Um, so, you know, pretty well controlled symptoms in, in these dyads. We asked patients and caregivers to rate their own sense of social support using enriched um, and patients felt more social support than caregivers did. Again, small, small, small numbers here. And then kind of terrifying, but also really important to notice, um, we asked patients and just kind of by a fluke, we happened to ask caregivers to rate their own fatigue. And caregivers rated their fatigue almost equivalent to patients supported by a VAD. And so we've, we've asked ourselves quite a lot of questions about, um, are the, quest, are the items on the promise fatigue measure somehow more um, sensitive to the needs of these particular caregivers than even the caregiver burden items? So 
Um, we also asked caregivers to rate caregiver burden and they basically rated it moderate or even low um, compared to a lot of other studies where you see caregivers having quite a lot of burden. So um, this measure was developed for dementia patients and caregivers and, um, and there's a lot of behavior type items that aren't quite as relevant um, in the heart failure community. So I think this paper is why I'm here. Um, we published a paper in the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing called A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words. Um, and we basically identified three themes. And I can tell you in words first, but then I'll, of course, show you some pictures. So um, importantly, we were looking to understand tasks and responsibilities. And um, most concerning to both patients and caregivers is the level involve of involvement in bathing routines. Um, driveline dressing care, less so. You know, a lot of patients had started to take over their own driveline dressing care. And I, I imagine there's some differences between management practices at Yale and Hopkins, but still. And then medication management um, and, and routine accompaniment to um, visits was also pretty important for caregivers. Homes had been adapted um, in several ways, a lot for sleeping and a lot of bathroom um, adaptations. And not all of the adaptations were safe. <laughs> so um, particularly in the bathroom, we had a couple of concerns. I'll show you um, some concerns for environmental cleanliness. But I'll just say also that before we look at pictures, it's really important to think that these are people's homes. And they invited us in. And they um, gave us the opportunity to get to know them and share their space with them. And knowing that they're living with such constrained financial conditions in many cases, um, it was important for us to kind of assess our own judgment before we before we looked into their spaces. So first, some pictures of, of bathroom situations. And um, you know, the first picture on the left, this, this is a gentleman who has been supported by his bad for more than a year. He'd had a recent hospitalization and he still wasn't showering. Um, we recommend that our patients start showering, you know, once they're well healed, uh, usually around three months, but he just was too nervous about it. And so he'd been showering using this stool in the sink and his wife helped him. Um, a little bit with uh, parts that he couldn't reach. And then the middle picture was kind of our favorite approach to having professionally installed hooks installed in the bathroom. Um, but very, very, very few <laughs> of our dyads had had, had really um, a strong approach to the way that they adapted their bathroom. And, and the far right picture is actually a shower rod. The patient is kind of indicating there that's how he hung his bad over the shower rod. And so if you don't ask the question, you're never going to know. Um, but I hadn't, as a, as a VAD coordinator, I, I worked as a VAD coordinator for a couple of years. I had never asked that question. What do you do with your VAD while you're in the shower? And um, so his shower curtain had fallen. He had had some trauma. So it is an important thing to understand. Bedroom adaptations, I'm sure um, you kind of, you're asking the pillows question, I think a lot, and when you're asking about symptoms. And so, but um, how have couples especially have had to adapt their sleeping arrangements, um, bringing a recliner into the bedroom? They actually did that after VAD, um, which I was kind of surprised at. I would have thought before VAD they might have needed to do that, but just with the way the cords were arranged, um, cords and tripping hazards were a little bit of a concern for people. They were just trying to manage that. We found out more people were sleeping on batteries than we had wanted to know about. <laughs> um, and then just, you know, the amount of equipment filling a space that might not have been ready to receive a lot of equipment and extra supplies and, you know, in some cases in bedrooms, we were seeing evidence of multimorbidity and, um, and just trying to think about how uh, families are navigating all of that in the home. I think usually in clinic, we, we have a little bit of a sense of this, but it was interesting to see medication management stations in people's homes. And if they had a medication management station, you know, our hearts went pitter patter when we saw the, the kind of picture on the left you know, oh, this is an organized person. This makes us excited. Look at those little Dixie cups. Like they are ready. They are handling it. Um, but then on the far right, what does it mean that we use a bag system for meds? And okay, how well are they handling, you know, changes in, in diuretics or other meds? And um, so really thinking about, okay, what indicators could we get at clinic that would help cue us to um, important things to think about in terms of medication management? Because even with the best guideline directed medical therapies, we, it's only as good as what they actually do in their homes, right? 
And then some more interesting um, concerns. So, um, you know, as a bedside nurse, I had managed the VAD um, when patients were toileting, but I hadn't really thought about what happens for patients when they're toileting at home. And so this guy was using a, a big box and he was saying, it helps me so much. I want to set the VAD down, um, helps me be able to reach. And it's really something that never occurred to us, but we wanted him to think about, hey, is there something we could put next to the toilet that you could wipe down to set your VAD on? So, you know, something to think about. And then a um, couple of concerns in the picture on the right-hand side, the VAD equipment on the floor, um, their cat wasn't feeling super well. And so the um, equipment was awfully close to some cat emesis and just, you know, wanting to help them think about the safest way to keep their batteries, store their batteries, get them off the floor and maybe protect them from the cat as well. And just a few other images from the home as we were seeing, you know, the tangle of cords um, and tripping hazards when somebody's waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, what they were having to contend with and how the family caregiver was often having to wake up to help because it was just too much to sort out, um, even sometimes sleeping with lights on. Um, so much other equipment. Uh, we did see some home monitoring, although not very often. And then the bottom picture is um, mostly of adult diapers and medical supplies, but a lot of families, particularly with high financial strain, really had a hard time storing their VAD supplies, um, dressing supplies, and, and other equipment. So um, finding locations, finding bins um, were all like kind of useful tips that, that we were thinking about how we could do better assessing and then and then support patients who have greater need. So kind of a quick summary, I think um, we certainly learned about home adaptations to manage multiple chronic conditions, not just the VAD. And it really inspired us to think differently about um, what happens when the patient goes home and when we're managing chronically, what kind of questions we could ask. Um, caregivers were reminding us of the ways that they do feel constantly that they have to be vigilant. Um, and then the importance of thinking about medication and appointment coordination in the home. These were all kinds of topics that really rose to the surface for us. And it wasn't what you asked about, but I just thought I'd mention we, um, from this very small study, we've um, published two papers and we have another one that we're working on. This one, um, same, same group, um, but it was important to us to ask how the dyad was managing uncertainty um, and end of life considerations. You know, we're mostly working with DT patients at this point. And um, dyads really struggled to talk about this, this thing. It's like an elephant in the corner that, um, that was very much on their mind, but they were afraid to bring it up and have a conversation about. And uh, it's, it's an area of interest for me. So it was something that we wanted to explore. You know, for patients, when we asked them about you know, what does quality of life mean to you? Um, it meant having independence and the ability to enjoy everyday moments with loved ones and not being a burden. Um, caregivers describe good quality of life as having resources and freedom to be comfortable and do the things that they enjoy. And you just wonder the extent to which the experience of living with the VAT is kind of drawing those things out. And importantly, one of our kind of learnings from that was that, you know, dyads are really on this spectrum of, no, we don't talk about that. We will not talk about that. You know, if we talk about that, it means that it's a possibility. To the far other end, of course we talk about that. It's important. I want to think about my wife and my kids so that they um, have an opportunity. So I'll just, you know, briefly mention that it's, it's on people's minds and they would love an opportunity to get the chance to talk about it with providers. So, you know, where do we go from this pilot work and, and what are some things that we're thinking about um, exploring a little bit in clinical practice and maybe even in future um, intervention trials, maybe. Um, just caregivers are really stressed about equipment setup. And in our system, you know, we practice in the hospital, but then, you know, we say, call us if you need us, but often they're, they, they're afraid to or just, I think there's a real opportunity for them to snap a picture of their equipment set up and say, hey, I did it and, and think about, um, or maybe even a, a tele, telehealth video call. Um, just a quick snapshot of the, the sleeping space. Um, thinking more about mobility and safety, we actually thought that we would see more 
adaptations of home for mobility needs, but we didn't see it really at all in the VAD clinic um, patients. And that could be part of who said yes to us. Um, there might have been more in, in sicker patients or caregiver um, dyads, but um, and then assessing for medication management, checking in after dose changes, um, making sure that old pill bottles have been gotten rid of. And just, uh, I mentioned before that importance of a, a low judgment if we are gonna think about how we're visualizing their homes. Um, I, I'm, I recorded a talk for AHA about uh, this, well, kind of this paper, and um, they, they were wondering about what are telehealth implications. And so, you know, phone, video, static pictures. I think we can even learn a lot from static pictures. We've used static pictures for driveline dressing and driveline assessment um, a little bit in clinical practice. You know, take me, take a picture of that for me. You, you know, you're complaining of pain. Why don't you take a picture and send it to me? Um, but uh, thinking about how that works with the EHR is important to think about as well. And then I'll just say also, you know, um, we depend on our caregivers, uh, but often we we depend on them only at points when we really need them. And uh, Larry Allen and Colleen McKelvin, and they had kind of suggested this approach to annual assessment that included um, caregiver assessment and um, and maybe even a check in about the home environment and equipment without having to bring everything in. Um, I think we could think more about medication management education. We have some great uh, pharmacists who do home visits sometimes through a special program. And um, I think we could even just use pictures to develop an understanding of teaching needs. Um, frequent assessment of how functional changes are affecting the family and uh, support for caregivers to develop um, a caregiving support team. So that's really part of my work is we, we took this and we worked on developing an intervention to support caregivers. Um, one, one important thing is they're often doing a lot of caregiving tasks that could be divided up in their family. And so sometimes they need a little help navigating that. And then just uh, reminding caregivers that they need to take care of themselves and their own health so that they can be available for, for patients and for the future. Um, yeah, and this is my team. Thanks so much for inviting me. And I'm really happy to talk to you about anything else related to the study or otherwise. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Martha, for that. Um, does anybody out there have any questions um, that they'd like to pose at this time? Hi, Martha. I'm Sharon. I'm one of the LVAC coordinators here at Yale. And um, it's interesting that you did a study on dyads and people who have a support system because we have about I would say 30% of our patients have no support system and they're doing it on their own. Um, so they're doing the combination of being their own support, figuring all that out on their own. Um, I always wish there was funds for, we talk to our patients about getting a, like a microwave cart for the side of their bed and they could fit everything on there where their dressings are underneath. And I almost feel stupid suggesting it sometimes because I know they don't have $80 to buy a microwave cart to do that. Um, it and, and the video visits or taking pictures of their environment, a lot of them don't even have a phone that can take a picture. They don't have access to, um, we have a support group now that was on Zoom. We didn't have one patient who signed in. Um, our patients who could sign in because they have a phone, they're busy living their lives and the ones who actually need the support group don't have access to the phone to be able to get on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so we find that we have those couples that have, you know, a great support system. They have everything figured out. Um, and then we go to the other extreme of uh, people just figuring it out amongst themselves and trying to find... Um, we get hand-me-down shirts from other bad patients that we give our bad patients, you know, they wear the shirts with the holsters mm -hmm. inside, you know, so it, like resources and the ability to, it, we give them the VAD, but we don't give them anything else for their VAD. We don't give them the hook for the showers. We don't give them like a cart for all their equipment. We don't give them the wearables. We give them a bag and, and the holsters, you know, it's, there's so much more that goes into it. Um, I, I wish we could, you know, 
I ever hit the lottery, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to give it to all the bad patients who need all this stuff. But um, that that's the challenges that we find. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys have that group of patients that are doing it on their own, like 30% of your patients. We definitely don't at Hopkins. So in Maryland, we have kind of some weird rules that limit our volume. And so we've been pretty strict about um, a 24-7 available caregiver um, as part of our selection criteria. And um, it's interesting. I know in transplant, I've been working on a paper about social support and transplant. And so uh, I know from that work that often those who are more socially isolated or don't have a caregiver, they perceive more support from the team. So I am sure that the kind of support that you guys are giving to your socially isolated patients means a lot to them. Um, but I definitely hear you on what's the point of me suggesting a microwave cart for $80 if they can't afford it. Um, I, I think we need to get creative in our teams about, you know, pushing, pushing that a little bit. Um, I know as a coordinator, you don't have time, right? But as a team, we could think about how could we fund that? for our program because the cost of the VAD is quite high. And for our patients to live well with the VAD, th this is kind of a comparably low cost, but what if it could really help them? And, you know, so a tub for driveline dressing supplies, a microwave cart, you know, I, I think we could get creative. We could think about a funder. We actually had a couple of um, patients who left the program some money after they passed. And um, we've kept it as a reserve pot in case a family had needs. And so that's been useful um, at times, but you know, I think we could get creative and, and certainly while you're like right in that moment in practice, that's harder to do, but, um, but I, I think our patients deserve it. And particularly if we're gonna implant patients who have these greater social needs. And the point about phones, um, we have found during COVID that we've been able to find companies that are willing to donate phones and Wi-Fi. Um, so again, put the team on the job and, um, and let's think about how we could be creative for addressing those needs because pretty important for a bad patient to have access to, to you. <laughs> I think sometimes it, we we think of it as being, and, and it is beyond your scope, right? Like your job is already so big as a cardiac surgeon or an advanced heart failure fellow. But, but if we think of ourselves as part of a multidisciplinary team and really function that way, then um, you guys are, some of you are writing grants, I know you are, and building in just that little extra pot of money for thinking about um, some practical applications or how we can move the needle on social determinants for people, I think we could really make a difference. We do have a fund of uh, donated money from a, a previous patient um, that we use for addressing kids for our Medicaid yeah. patients who's okay. insurance. So, and we've asked that fund um, for other stuff that we could cover. We just haven't gotten them to do it yet. And we've applied for a few grants um, um, the coordinators, you know, just so we could use buy everybody a shirt or something, you yeah. know, but we haven't been able to, I, I think LVADs are not well known. Yes. So when you're asking for these things, it doesn't seem like such a need, even though, you know, it is, I, I don't, it's hard to, um, to, if people don't know what a VAD is and what it's like to live with the VAD, they don't know how important maybe just buying a shirt for a patient is, you know? Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for all your comments because I mean, yes, pie in the sky research is only as helpful as, you know, those common denominators of, you know, are we really helping the people that need it most? And, and that's a fair point. Would anybody else uh, like to ask Martha a question? Or have a comment about what she presented? Can I ask one more question? Sorry. <laughs> um, do you, does the VAD team do a home assessment, you know, outside of the study? Is it routine for them to do a home assessment, assessment on every patient? 
um, not a home visit, a home assessment. So um, we, we ask common questions, we provide a folder, we ask them to check in. Um, and, you know, I, I've talked to, I've worked in a couple of programs, collected data with a couple of programs, and there's definitely a wide variety. I know um, some friends at ANOVA who they do a little bit more in the community and sometimes even doing the home visits. Um, so at, at Hopkins, we don't. But there were a couple instances um, when I was a bad coordinator that either the social worker or one of us went out to the home in a particularly concerning situation. So we have made it work when we needed to. Um. While uh, maybe somebody's thinking of a, a question before we wrap up, I guess Martha, what you know, through all this um, work that you've done and, and really going into folks' homes, and uh, I'm sure a lot of things maybe took you by surprise um, about what you saw. I, I guess if you had to summarize, you know, obviously it's it's difficult to to address everything um, for everybody, but if if there was was there a common theme of one of something that you know if for example, you know, we, we wanted to do some type of a, a project or fundraiser type thing to try to uh, be able to obtain a certain um, form of medical equipment or just um, home furniture or whatever it may be for patients. What, what in your experience from the things that you've seen, do you think are things that we don't think about most and probably would be the most helpful for people? Um, well, that's a great question. And I think there's a little bit of a philosophical question about, you know, do you do the thing that helps the people who need it most or do you do the thing for everyone? Um, but I would say across the board, everyone was most frustrated with bathing routines and um, and just, you know, the frustration of living with a VAD and not being able to submerge. That's one part of it. But then just the, the way they've had to figure out bathing in the home and um, and I think many of them weren't even thinking about the safety considerations in terms of dropping the VAD or um, having a safe place to set the VAD, but just the frustration of how do I get clean and feel clean. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then caregivers too feeling, you know, and there's this, um, especially developmentally, if if you have younger VAD patients, you know, they, they want to be independent, but especially our younger ones, you know, if their caregiver was a parent, um, or a spouse, you know, it really was this moment of, I, I wanna be independent with this, but I'm just not sure it's safe to do that. So helping people think through, you know, just taking a picture of the home environment, showing it to you, um, showing you their bathroom and what, what they're thinking about doing for getting a shower, and then um, what could be the safest solution and what could help them get the most independence. I think that would, could be really impactful. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts out there? Well, if not, um, I want to thank you again so much for joining us. This was a really neat talk. And I think, um, you know, uh, brought up a lot of things that, like I said, we, I don't think we typically think about every day, at least I don't. And maybe that's my own fault. But I know it's things that you know, members of our team like Sharon and Nicole and Angie that work with our VAD patients probably do come into um, contact with on a frequent basis and things that if we are really trying to improve quality of life and in, in these people, uh, you know, and if, you know, in, in, in addition to trying to extend life with the VAD, um, you know, these things are obviously things that need to be considered as well. So thank you for sharing your work and look uh, forward to seeing seeing more of what you're able to, to produce for for oh, your thanks and just you know we were really focused on the caregivers and what was happening for caregivers so um i just i think it's a really important takeaway that i don't i don't think that this work is about changing our clinical practice right now there might be some low-hanging fruit that could change our clinical practice right now um but if in your training you've never visited a patient's home mm -hmm. um it would be a great, great experience. I mean, it really, it was 
even though, you know, I've been in critical care for a long time, being able to be in their home really meant a lot. And you just see the richness of their lives and how this extension of life um, through the VAD is really giving them quality of life, access to their grandchildren and doing the activities that they love so much that we kind of get a glimpse of in clinic, but sometimes not. So I think it really, it can also um, just excite you about the work you're doing if uh, sometimes there's there's a lot of gloom in bad world, so um, yeah. there's a good side to getting out there too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, and everybody, thanks for joining us, and um, hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. Bye.